Some of you I know really well, and some of you we're still getting to know each other. So I always want to share some things that are like happening under the Seifert roof so that you can see, you know, just what's going on here. So I wanted to introduce you. Um, there's a little photo up here. This, this is um, our, my, my guy. His name is uh, Robo. This is a Robo Bear. That I found <laughs> that I found on my art table. Now the kids, the little kids, tell me they made this guy, and his name is Bob. <laughs> but I have questions, <laughs> right? I mean, the pandemic's been hard for everybody, right? Like phonics, we might just need to like revisit what's going on here. You guys, look at this guy. He's amazing. He's a Robo Bear. Um, <laughs> Now, the questions I don't have about is like his style. Check out his mustache, phenomenal. This is my, my little Judah drew this guy and his Under Armour gear, right? This guy is styling. So this has nothing to do with anything. I just wanted to show you. I found this the other day and I was like, Robo Bear strikes again. Bob is what we're just, I don't even know. I don't know if that's inappropriate. I'm not gonna come back, but this is, this is what's happening <laughs> at our house. So there's that guy, okay. Um, no, listen, this morning I'm really excited to, to be with you guys, and I really wanted to start our time with this quote by one of my favorite authors. Her name is Shauna Nequist, and she says this, of all the things I'm learning to leave behind, one of the heaviest is the opinions of others. Mm, right? That'll preach. I could just go, you know, like that's it. Like we just, <laughs> she, oh, it's so good. Listen, I remember the day that I stopped carrying spare change around in my wallet. I don't know if you guys it, carry that, you know, just change, just pick it up here and there. But you would have thought I unloaded like a small elephant, boy, the, how, how lighter my purse felt after I unloaded this small change. And it was just quarters and dimes and nickels that I had collected slowly over time. But man, it was a weight that I had carried around. And some of us carry some heavy things around with us. Like spare change, you just pick up here and there. And slowly over time, you're like, ooh, there's a lot going on here. Maybe we, maybe we carry around limiting beliefs about ourselves or about who God is. Or maybe we, we carry the opinions of others. And that's heavy. Maybe we carry around the criteria for being successful or the criteria of, of what it means to be okay. So, so some if-then statements, like if I just have this job title, then I'll be okay. You know what I'm talking about? If I just have this person in my life, then I'll be okay. Like we carry around these things. And God says, listen, I don't want you to be so heavy. There's some things I want you to unload so you can be lighter. I'm here to give you a lighter load. That's, that's what Jesus talks about often. So this morning, I want to look at one of my favorite passages in Scripture. It's in the book of John, and you better know it's with, between Jesus and a woman, right? It's really, I don't know if you guys have noticed, like, I'm a woman, and so I really care when Jesus and a woman hang out. I'm like, I, feel, I see myself in Scripture, right? How many ladies are in the house? Can you just raise your hand if you're a lady in the house? Yes, keep it up. Now, these are, yes, the ladies. Now, raise your hand if you love a lady, like if you love a mom or a sister or a daughter, yes, keep it up. Or, or, or you know, whoever. So the story this morning is for all y'all with your hands raised. Look around. This story is for everybody in this room, right? That's what we're going to look at. This is John chapter 4. Um, and it's just going to be a good time. Here's the thing. Before we get to our story, I, we need this framework. Work. The culture that, G that Jesus stepped into there was a prominent Jewish narrative going on regarding who would be allowed to be in the kingdom of God and who would be allowed to even interact with God. And so the, this is from the author James Bryan Smith, who he's a theologian, and he studied under Dallas Willard. Lucky ducky. That would have been so fun. And he gives us, okay, this was the dominant assumption and narrative that there needed to be five things that were true of you to be in the kingdom of God or to even interact with the kingdom of God. And this is a framework I want you to keep in mind when we get to our story. So here's the deal. Five requirements for the kingdom of God accepted in the Jewish culture when Jesus arrived. This, you needed to be Jewish. God had chosen the nation of Israel. They believed this and was not going to invite non-Jews to the kingdom. This is just what they taught. And only those who were Jewish would be allowed to interact with God. So that's what's assumed. You need to be Jewish. The second thing is you need to be male. In Jesus' day, women were considered second class, you know, even as far as property. 
And some rabbis even said women didn't even have the same souls as men. I don't know what that means, but that's not it, right? Th three, um, you needed to be holy and ritually pure. So the thought was the, the rightful recipients of the kingdom of God would be faithful keepers of the law. So the kingdom was not available to someone who did not eat kosher or observe the Sabbath, but must, uh, much less known as a sinner, like, say, a prostitute or an adulterer or a tax collector. Third one, you needed to be, or fourth one, sorry, you need to be physically whole and healthy. These were requirements, right? Sickness, they said, was a sign of sin and God's curse, and the kingdom was not available to the diseased, the blind, or the lame. And again, this is the fifth cultural requirement assumption in, in Israel this time. You needed to be wealthy. <laughs> I love that. The poor had been abandoned by God, is what they said, and therefore the kingdom was for those who were wealthy. The poor were not on the kingdom guest list. Keep that framework in mind as we read our story, that they thought Jewish, male, holy, healthy, wealthy, okay? So we're going to go to John chapter 4, and some of you guys know this story well. If you grew up in church, you're like, yeah, the woman at the well, I know. I am praying against something feeling familiar to you, but that this would be fresh to you this morning. That would hit you, hit you different, right? Okay. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So as any good Bible study teacher would do, we're just going to make some observations about what's happening in the text here, right? So Jesus is traveling back to Galilee because he didn't want to be involved in some sort of, I don't know, baptism competition that was happening with John the Baptist and what was going on there. But he's like, there is room for everybody here. I'm just going to travel back. No problem. Um, also, many translations say that Jesus had to go through Samaria. But newsflash, Jesus never had to do anything, right? He chose to go through Samaria. And we'll look at that a little further. He chose, he chose to go to a place where there weren't Jewish, male, holy, healthy, and wealthy people. He chose. It's hot because it's around noon, and in that culture, Noon, hot, midday. And I, verse 6, did you guys see who gets tired? Jesus got tired. Our Jesus got, anybody tired in the room? Yes, raise it high, no problem. Our Jesus got tired. He got weary. He put on human flesh and so that he could experience absolutely everything, even just exhaustion. He knows what it's like to get tired on the journey going from here to there. It's just a welcoming truth. It's just a small little moment. That's the first thing I want us to see. He got tired. If you're feeling tired, God says, I know. I know. It's not something that I don't know. I can be with you in this. Yeah. And now we need a smidge of history for our story. In Jesus' day, there were three regions stacked on top of one another. I have a little map here so we can see. There was Galilee in the north, Samaria in the middle, and Judea at the bottom. It was kind of a Samaritan sandwich, right? It's got these things going on. Um, and the easiest and quickest way to go from Judea to Galilee would to be due north, right? Just straight shot. No problem. Um, but here's the thing. The Jews and the Samaritans, they really disliked each other. Like, deeper than, like, Ohio State versus Michigan fans. You know what I mean? Like, deeper. Like, just a, just a dislike. <laughs> and uh, this goes back to 722 B.C. The Assyrians, Assyrians captured Israel, and they took 10 of the northern tribes um, up north, and they started to um, be friendly and breed with, with other Gentiles. And so they were sort of this half-Jew, and they were called the Samaritans, and they... They had their own sort of religion, just sort of half of everything. And so those who were purely Jewish were like, mm-mm. There was major, major um, dislike 
here, but I just want you to know, Jesus, yeah, he refused to carry around the weight of hatred. He wasn't going to do it. He was, he was going right through Samaria. In fact, he went to Samaria on purpose because he had somebody he wanted to talk to on purpose. He had somebody he wanted to meet. So let's keep reading. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, um, I mean, like, you're a Jew. <laughs> and I'm a Samaritan woman. I'm not sure if you understand what's happening right here, Jesus. Um, how can you ask me for a drink? And I love in the, in the Bible, there's this parenthetical statement that says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. She's like, I don't know. Like, we shouldn't be having this conversation. She's very aware. And here's what I want us to see about this cultural moment. The second thing, Jesus is opening up the guest list for the kingdom of God. Right here. He's opening it up. You know that list of five, right? Jewish, male, holy, healthy, wealthy. She is none of these. She's none of these. And he was flipping that script all the time. Like, that's what he came to do, was just flip it and say, listen, my guest list is wide and open, and you are welcome no matter where you're coming from, right? But the hard work of opening up the guest list of the kingdom of God was actively working against racism and sexism. That's what Jesus was doing. Because there were versions of racism and sexism that were considered socially and religiously virtuous at that time. Like the Jewish traditions didn't just say that racism was bad when it comes to Samaria. They said, it's good. Let's celebrate. This is how God would want it. Like, let's, let's be separate from these people, right? So let's avoid Samaritans at all costs. So in that day, if Jews needed to go to get around Samaria, they would, they would go around. They would, they would add three more days to their journey just so they could avoid Samaria. And Jesus says, not today, Satan. Uh-uh, I am going through. I'm opening up the guest list. We're going to just, we're, we're going here. He, was, he didn't come for a certain kind of person. He wasn't saying you needed to be shiny. You, didn't, you needed to be wealthy. You need to be all these, he's, he's just flipping it. And it's good, for, it's good news for those of us who feel a little bit broken and busted this morning. A little bit marginalized, a little bit, we don't have it together, right? Let's keep going in our story. Jesus answered her, so she's like, um, we shouldn't be talking. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water. Sir, the woman says, um, so I see that you have nothing to draw with, like you've no water jar, and this well is deep. She knows about the well. Where can you get this living water? What's going on here? Are you, are you greater than our father Jacob, who built this well and drank from it, and his sons and his livestock? Like, what's going on? And Jesus answered. He says, everyone who drinks from this well will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I'm going to give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Like, he's going deep with her right here. And the one says, sir, I mean, can you give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and keep coming back right here to this place, right? She's still talking physical water. I mean, that's what she's at the well for. And he goes, he goes to the heart. He's talking spiritual water, right? And not only is he talking to a Samaritan right here, a non-Jew, he's talking to a woman, right? Again, only Jewish men, please, but he's, he's doing something. A woman who came at noon to fill her water jar, which some of you might know this. The text doesn't clearly say this here, but the educated ones tell us that she probably wanted to be a bit more anonymous, um, unbothered, unseen, and might not have been welcome with the women that came early in the morning to draw when it wasn't so hot. There's something going on here. Later in the text, we, 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 we find out why. But right here, Jesus, they just talk water. They talk water. I mean, he meets her right where she is at the well, and they talk water. But she came to fill her water jar, and he came to fill her soul. Like, that's what's happening here, Right? She's talking physical thirst, and he's talking spiritual thirst. He's always doing this. People are bringing up their just everyday life, and he's like, let's go a little deeper. Let's go down here. We're going to talk about bread. We're going to talk about the bread of life. He's always just, he's doing this. 
Now, here's the deal. Here's the third thing I want want you guys to see. The very thing that takes you to Jesus is often what he wants to free you from. Mm -hmm. The very thing that takes you to Jesus is what he wants to free you from. Which leads me to ask you the question, what's your water jar? Because she brought a water jar. She was coming to, to fill her water jar. What, what is it? Right? What's that heavy thing that you are carrying that weighs you down, that you want to set down, but you might not know how? You know, the thing that, that just keep, you keep having that same conversation with God about, maybe? What's, what's heavy for you? For me, people-pleasing is a heavy weight I can carry around. I'm learning to, to set it down more and more, but that's why that Sean and Equist quote really speaks to me, the opinions of others, right? That can weigh me down. Because I'm, I'm afraid if I ruffle feathers or if I speak out about something that I think is wrong or if, if I misstep, then I, people won't like me or I'll lose my worthiness to be loved and accepted. And Jesus says, put it down. Stop carrying that. That's so heavy. Put it down. I have love and acceptance and grace and peace for you. I have something better for you, right? He wants to free me. He wants to say, hey, you are loved in every situation by me. Go forward. Stand tall. You're mine. Then nothing that happens can take that away. You will be my daughter forever and ever and ever and ever. He wants to free me of that. So what is it? What is heavy? What's that water jar you're carrying around? We'll talk more about it, but let's keep going in our story. So he told her, you know, go call your husband and come back. (laughs) And she says, "Um, I don't have a husband. And he said to her, you're right when you say that you have no husband. And the fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you're now with is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. It's quite true. So now he's talking thirst again, but this time her thirst to be loved. He's talking about her thirst to be loved. She's been with a lot of guys. She wants to be loved. Really normal, built-in desire of our humanity, right? He's like, let's talk about this. And she's, she's, she switches the subject. She's like, okay, we're going here. I just, I got a few questions then. Sir, I can see that you're a prophet, <laughs> Um, I can see, yeah, our ancestors worshipped on the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we worship is Jerusalem. She's talking talking worship now. Like, let's talk about this. And Jesus says, woman. And this is a term of endearment, not like woman. He's like, woman. (laughs) Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. I find it very interesting that she brings up worship, and he said, okay, let's talk about that. And he brings up spirit and truth. He's like, hey, listen. There'll be a time where there won't need to be a place you must go to access God. You can be in a movie theater. And you can meet with God because it's about our spirit. And then he says, let's talk about truth, right? And he brings up what's true in her life. Right? He brings up the truth. Because worshiping Jesus starts by telling the truth. Right? Comes with your honest heart. Right, where you just tell him, like, this is, here I am. I'm busted, I broke it, I, I made this choice. I had this experience, I've had this abuse. I've had, the, here it is, God. And he can work with that, your honesty, right? But if you're hiding, it's really hard to worship God with this thing in between, right? He says, no hiding, no pretending. I, I want to restore the true you. I'm interested in truth. And the woman said, Well, um, I I mean, you know, her brain is probably swirling. What is going on? She says, well, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Like, I know we'll we'll get the full story when he arrives at some point, right? And then Jesus declared, you know what? Guess what? It's me. Can you imagine? What is going on? He's like, it's me. I'm the one. The one who's talking to you right now, it's me. I'm the Messiah. 
Okay, this is great. The disciples, they come back because they were getting food, and they were surprised to find somebody. They're like, who, what is happening here, you know? But no, no one asked. They're just thinking him. No, no one asked, you know, uh, you know, why are you talking to her? What do you want? Like, what's going on? I love this. Now, here's the thing. The verse says, then, leaving her what? Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, you guys, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? I mean, she's stoked. She left her water jar. She runs into town. They came out of town, and now they're coming toward Jacob's well to Jesus. They're like, what? And she's gathering people. She's like, come on. And the rest, of, you know, there's a little bit of moment of a story we won't see here, but then the, the, it ends here. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony that he told me everything I ever did. He told me what was true. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two more days. Listen, many Jews would have traveled three days around Samaria, but Jesus took three days to invest in Samaria. He's like, I'm staying. These people matter. I don't care if you're Jewish, male, holy, healthy, or wealthy. It's not about it. He's got a different thing. It says, and because of these words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, well, you know what? We no longer believe just because of what you said. We've now heard for ourselves. Oh, it's amazing. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. The Samaritans are saying it. This is bananas. It's bonkers that this is, this is what's happening here. Listen, friends. She left her water jar. She left her water jar. It may have been the physical thing that took her to Jesus, this water jar, but that water jar, it represents her shame. It was her shame that she came at noon. It was her shame that she couldn't come in the morning to, with all the other women. She was too embarrassed to be seen. It was her shame that brought her to the well to begin with, right? That's what was going on here. But then she left her shame with Jesus and ran shamelessly to tell everybody about him. She just started running, right, everything. Friends, by leaving her water jar, she became a messenger. She became a bringer of good news. She became an evangelist, right? Jesus traded her shame for joy. He traded her shame for a job to do. He traded her shame to, to be a bringer of good news, right? He sent a shifty woman to shift an entire city. That's what he did. She wasn't a Jewish man. Holy, healthy, and wealthy. And he made sure of it. He made a point. So what's your water jar this morning? Is it your shame of your past choices? Or past abuse? Or divorce? Or financial trouble? Or job loss, right? Or is it your fear of being alone? Or of being nothing? Or looking silly? Or needing to be brave and you don't think you can't? Or it's your comfort or your insecurities? Like what, what is the thing? Is it your physical health that you're battling? Or your grief or your chronic illness? Like what, what is it? Please hear me say, I am not guaranteeing if you bring that water jar to Jesus that he's going to heal you and fix you. I'm not guaranteeing that. He might. He might bring healing. But even if he does not, as Daniel tells us, even if he doesn't, I can guarantee that he wants to free you from carrying this as your identity. He wants to free you from carrying this alone. He has grace and power and strength. Three times Paul says, will you take this thorn in my flesh away? And God didn't, but he said, listen, I'm going to give you grace and power to be able to do this. Let's do this together. Right? He's got strength, grace power. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, Amy, this sounds really great, like way up here. Let's take my water jar and, you know, give it to Jesus. But what does this look like on like a Tuesday in October? Like in my normal everyday life, what does it look like for me to bring my water jar and leave it at Jesus's feet, right? Can I tell you guys about my husband? You guys mind? He's here. I asked. He said, sure. So three years ago, it might look like this, laying your water jar down. My husband, Rob, was having this conversation. He kept having the same conversation with God regarding alcohol in his life. 
not as an addict, but as this was the thing, he, he kind of felt like he was just managing all the time. Like, is this okay if I have just a drink here or, or one more here? Like, just this conversation. Is this okay, right? And it became exhausting. And he kind of sensed, God might want to have some different conversations with me than this thing, right? And so one, three years ago, one New Year's Eve, God said, will you trust me with this? Will you trust me with alcohol? And he said, okay. And so he gave it up. And something started to happen in his life. Because I want you to know that God doesn't just say, give me your water jar, and then you're going to stay empty-handed. That, no, 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 no. Give me your water jar. I have good things to fill your empty hands with. And God started to give him some words not audible, but he had some words for people, some words of encouragement, some understanding of some things that were about to happen, and then they did. There was some prophecy that was going on. He had some things for him to see and to do. And then God brought this young man into his life who was thirsty to know Jesus, was exploring Jesus, but, but was, couldn't even say the name Jesus when they would get together and talk about God, and Rob felt like God said, buy this man a Bible, read the book of Matthew, oh, and his amazing musical talent that he has that you see all over Northwest Ohio, soon this guy will start writing worship songs and will be a worshiper. And so he had, he, he's like, I don't know, he's telling me about these things, I, this is what I'm thinking. I'm like, hey, let's see what God does. And sure enough, they're reading the Gospels. Some things were let go, and our friend Dean, he became a believer. He starts writing songs about God, and then he starts writing songs for worship. And one of my favorite moments is when I, I was at our church. My husband is our worship pastor, and they're setting up church one morning. And I see my husband set up his microphone, and then I see this other microphone come right next to him. And Rob's getting his guitar ready, tuning it. And then Dean comes over, our, our new believer friend, and he gets his guitar ready. And they worship the Lord together. I have a, a picture of this, of them really coming and worshiping God, leading the congregation in church. Or someone who just two years ago was like, I don't know if I can even say his name. But now he's helping to lead people in worship. Listen, friends, God isn't wanting to just take something out of your hands and leave you empty. He wants to give you a job in the kingdom. He wants to give you an identity in the kingdom. He wants to give you good news in the kingdom. He has good work for you to do in the kingdom, but there might be something that you just keep having the same conversation with. He's like, let it go. I have other things for you. Be free of this. Get this out of the way so that we have this space to talk, just like this woman at the well, right? I want you to know you can trust Jesus with your water jar. He'll take care of it. He'll take, take care of you. He's got sweet things for you. But it's, it's a trust moment. It's a matter of faith. Friends, meet Jesus at the well. Meet him there. See what he does. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for every soul in the seats today, every man and woman and kiddo. And God, you know what heavy things we carry around. You were well acquainted with sorrows. You know grief, you know fear, you know anxiety. You you know what it is to walk on this earth and how heavy and hard this is. And you longed for us to have a different, lighter burden. You said, if anybody's weary, come to me. And I have a lighter load. Lay your heavy burden down. I have a rhythm of grace. Learn from me. Jesus, I pray that where, where there are water jars, there would be springs 
of wellness instead. God, would you give us, could you give us the strength to lay some things down? And then give us the power to pick up whatever you have for us in its place. We trust you and we worship you, Jesus.